Hello, welcome to the second lecture on moral theories. We've looked at two meta-ethical theories, emotivism and relativism. Uh, a meta-ethical theory is a theory that looks at the nature of moral statements, and uh, we saw that emotivism says that no uh, moral statements are, are true, no moral statements are false. They're they're incapable of being true or false. They really just boil down to emotional reactions. We saw that rel for relativism, the things the thing that determines the truth of a moral statement is society. So, if a society believes that um, killing is right, then killing is right, at least for that society. There are two other metaethical theories. Uh, we won't spend time on them, uh, much time on them. Uh, error theory is that. Uh, every moral statement is false. We're just in error about our moral statements. So when we say truth-telling is good, strictly speaking, that's just false. Or any, any moral statement you make is false. And then there's realism, which says something like um, the, truth of, the truth of moral statements uh, is not determined by any individual or society. If the truth of a moral statement is not determined by any individual or society. So this is opposed to relativism, where relativism, again, it says that the truth of a statement is determined by the society. Realism would say, no, there are just certain things that are right, regardless of what the society thinks. So like when Martin Luther King Jr. was opposing segregation, well, it doesn't, didn't matter that the society liked segregation, the society thought segregation was good. That didn't matter. Um, it was just good to desegregate, and segregation itself was bad. Um, so the society was wrong, and Martin Luther King Jr. was right. That's what realism says. It says that the truth of moral statements, at least for some of them, it's independent of uh, what people think about them. And then there are normative theories. These, these try to give standards for right and wrong, specific standards. And we'll see that uh, we see consequentialism as a moral theory, deontology, and, and virtue theory. And we'll, we'll get into those today. So consequentialism. This is a class of moral theories in which the moral value of any human action or behavior is determined exclusively by its outcome. All right, so what matters for consequentialism is the consequences of an action. If the action has good consequences, the action is good. If the action has bad consequences, the action is bad. Okay, so the rightness or wrongness of an action is determined by the outcome of the action. And a familiar way of thinking about this would be to say something like the ends justify the means. So if, um, you know, you, you commit some action, like uh, you steal a candy bar, and it has a good outcome, say, although, you know, it deprived the shopkeeper of his money, say, it provided you with much pleasure to uh, steal and eat this candy bar, and that good outcome outweighs the bad outcome of the shopkeeper being deprived of money, then this was a good out. This was a good action because it had a, had good consequences overall. Now it's based on the notion of teleology. Consequentialism is based on the notion of teleology. This is the philosophical belief that the value of an action or object can be determined by looking at the purpose or the end. The end being the outcome of the action or object. So um, the outcome or the end. Uh, or the purpose of stealing the candy bar for that individual was to receive pleasure from the action. And the subsequent eating of the candy bar. Um, so, so yeah, that, that's uh, teleology, the end in mind. Uh, the end is in view uh, when determining the rightness or wrongness of an action. So examples of consequentialist theories are egoism and utilitarianism. We'll look at egoism next. So, what do you think? Is it ever morally okay to torture an individual if the outcome is really good, or if the torturing prevents something really bad? What do you think? 
If you say that yes, it's sometimes morally okay to torture an individual if the outcome is really good, or if it prevents something really bad. If you say yes to that, then you think that sometimes, at least sometimes, the consequences of an action matter for whether the action is right or wrong. If so, so you know you've got this this say terrorist, and uh, you know you've got him in custody. And he tells you he's planted a bomb in Las Vegas, and you want to know where that bomb is. And, and say, suppose that torture is a good method for getting information out of people. And you know you can get the information out of that terrorist and save, say, uh, 10,000 lives if you just torture this terrorist. Now, if you think some, like, in that situation, because there are 10,000 lives on the line, it's morally okay, you know, done, you've done nothing morally wrong to torture that terrorist. If you think that's okay in that situation, well, then you think that sometimes the consequences of our actions matter for whether the actions that we commit are right or wrong. And so maybe consequentialism is the theory for you. Let's look at one particular version of consequentialism, ethical egoism. This is the consequentialist theory that everyone should act only in order to maximize his or her own individual pleasure or happiness. So how, okay, take Peter. How does Peter know how to act in a given situation? He doesn't need to, on ethical egoism, he doesn't need to consider whether it's gonna make his grandma happy he doesn't need to consider whether it's going to make uh, President Trump happy. He doesn't need to consider whether it's going to make his wife or his son or his sister happy. The only person he needs to consider on ethical egoism for, for uh, determining whether or not his action is right or wrong is himself, his own happiness or pleasure. Okay, this is distinct from psychological egoism Psychological egoism says that everyone acts in order to maximize his or her own individual pleasure. This is just a, a psychological, psychological egoism is not a moral theory. It's just a claim about a, a matter of fact. They're claiming that everyone only acts selfishly. That's distinct from whether or not everyone should act selfishly. Ethical egoism says the right thing for you to do is to act selfishly on behalf of your own pleasure. All right, so let's take an example. So um, Peter wants to know whether he should steal the candy bar. He knows that's going to cause the shopkeeper great displeasure. But he also knows that he has no qualms about stealing. You know, he doesn't, it doesn't make him sad or feel guilty when he steals. He, he just knows that he gets a rush from it. He gets a high. Um, so should he steal the candy bar. On ethical egoism, yes. On ethical egoism, if he steals the candy bar, it's going to make him very happy, and that's all that matters. His own happiness. That's what ethical egoism says. So the right thing, the moral thing for him to do is to steal the candy bar. He's done nothing morally wrong, and in fact, maybe he's even required to steal the candy bar because he's required to act on, <coughs> um, on behalf of his own happiness. So there is a sort of uh, appeal to ethical egoism. Uh, it says that it's right to be selfish. That's appealing, right? You, you get to be selfish and a good person, right? So when we think of like good people, morally good people, we, we don't think necessarily, we don't necessarily think they're the people who get to have all the fun, right? They're the people who get to act they're the people who get to act um, only for themselves, right? Um, that's not the view we have of a good person. A, a view we have of a good person is, is of someone who would be willing to sacrifice their own well-being for the good of another, right? But ethical egoism says, no, 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 it, like, you can be a good person and, you, and a selfish person because... Being selfish just is being good. Um, so maybe you could think that's like a, a positive feature of egoism, that it, it uh, uh, 
you know, like allows you to be selfish. And in fact, you like maybe even your freaking Mother Teresa if you uh, act selfishly. All right. But there are some objections to ethical egoism. Here's one. If a wicked action maximizes your happiness, then ethical egoism endorses it. This is from James Rachel's article on ethical e egoism, which you can find on the internet. If a wicked action maximizes your happiness, then ethical egoism endorses it. This is an objection to ethical egoism. So it says, here's an example that James Rachel got from a newspaper. He found in the newspaper that uh, to increase his profits, a pharmacist filled prescriptions for cancer patients using watered down drugs. So this person didn't care about the cancer patients, whether they would die or not. This person presumably, oh yeah, it says to increase his profits for money, uh, was filling prescriptions using watered down drugs. So this person had a concern only for money, his own happiness, his own pleasure. But ethical egoism says, yeah, he did the right thing. He did the right thing because he was acting for his own pleasure. Now, if you, this is an objection because if you think that this pharmacist shouldn't have filled the prescriptions using watered down drugs solely for his own profits, then you shouldn't be an ethical egoist. James Rachels found this story in a newspaper as well. A nurse raped two pa patients while they were unconscious. So I take it that this nurse did it for his own or her own happiness, right? Own pleasure. Well, on ethical egoism, if it makes the nurse happy to do this, then the nurse should do it. But if you think, uh, and I think rightly so, that you would think this, if you think that it's immoral to do this to um, unconscious patients, immoral for a nurse to do this to unconscious patients, then you shouldn't be an ethical egoist. Because on ethical egoism, this would be the right thing to do. You might be uh, Mother Teresa in doing this, right? Uh, um, James Rachel's found a third story, which says parents fed a baby acid so that they could fake a lawsuit, claiming the baby's formula was tainted. So here you have parents who aren't looking out for the well-being of their child. They're looking out for the well-being of themselves. They're seeking to increase their own happiness and pleasure um, by getting money off of uh, their baby's demise. All right, so uh, clearly this is immoral. Uh, to feed your baby acid in order for in order to get lots of money, um, and furthermore, uh, to lie, to uh, to lie in the courts, right? Though that seems to be a secondary issue. Um, yeah. So if you think it's wrong to do this, and ethical egoism says it's right to do this, then you shouldn't be an ethical egoist. Here's a final example. A 13-year-old girl was kidnapped by a neighbor and kept shackled in an underground bomb shelter for 181 days while she was sexually abused. Now, if this kidnapper, if this made the kidnapper happy, ethical egoism said he should uh, kidnap that girl. But if you think that it's wrong to kidnap that girl, then you shouldn't be an ethical egoist. So these are all objections to ethical egoism. And the main point is that if a wicked action maximizes your happiness, ethical egoism says you should do it. Objection two is this. Egoism goes against the following moral principle. We can justify treating people differently only if we can show that there is some factual difference between them that is relevant to justifying the difference in treatment. So let's set aside ethical egoism for a second and consider racism. Racism is wrong. Why? Because you're, treat, you're treating someone different. Um, you're treating someone different morally when there's no factual difference between you and them. So, like, consider, uh, you know, um, a white person being racist against a, a black person, right? There's no sort of intrinsic uh, morally significant difference between white people and black people um, that would justify 
treating black people morally as inferior to white people. Since there's no sort of morally significant difference, um, if you treat black people as different um, than white people, um, then you've done something wrong. In order to justify the difference in treatment, you need to find a factual difference that's relevant. So, you know, here at CSN, we don't allow parrots, P-A-R-R-O-T-S, we don't allow, let's say, macaws to attend classes. So CSN treats humans differently than they treat macaws because they don't allow macaws to attend classes, but they allow humans to attend classes. What justifies this treatment, this different treatment? Because there's a factual difference, factual difference that's um, uh, between humans and parrots that makes it okay to uh, allow humans to take courses at CSN, but not parrots. All right. If you had the same reasoning, like if, if, if you said, we're not going to allow um, such and such a race to take courses at our school, but we'll allow this other race to take courses at our school, that's, that's wrong because there's no factual difference that's relevant to allowing one race to take courses at your school and not the other. Okay. How does that relate to ethical egoism? Well, it goes, ethical egoism goes against the principle. You're treating yourself as better than others when there's no factual difference between you and them that's relevant to justifying the difference in treatment. So suppose that I, you know, want, it makes me happy to harm other people. Ethical egoism says I can harm other people or I, maybe I should harm other people. But there's no factual difference between me and other people that makes it okay for me to treat them in that way. You know, they're not like, I'm not like way smarter than those people. Um, you know, those people can think just like me. They have emotions just like me. All those things. There's no relevant difference. All right, so that's the second objection. That's ethical egoism. Now let's look at utilitarianism. Utilitarianism is a consequentialist theory, so we've got another consequentialist theory, according to which all people ought to act in order to maximize the greatest pleasure or happiness for the greatest number. Baronet puts the, uh, the theory simply as the greatest good for the greatest number. Now you're not merely concerned for your own happiness, you're concerned for the happiness of all those that are impacted by your actions. So suppose I want to steal a candy bar and I know it's going to make the shopkeeper very unhappy and I know it's going to make me very happy and suppose that the unhappiness that the shopkeeper experiences outweighs uh, my own happiness. Suppose that it's going to make him really unhappy, and it's only going to make me slightly happy. Well, utilitarianism says you don't steal the candy bar, but flip it around. Suppose it makes me really happy to steal the candy bar, but it only makes the shopkeeper slightly unhappy. Suppose he doesn't even notice that the candy bar is stolen. Well, then, utilitarianism says I should steal the candy bar. It's a, just the greatest good, greatest happiness for the greatest number. Okay, so there are some difficulties for utilitarianism, like how do we even define happiness? Um, John Stuart Mill, a utilitarian, he defines happiness simply as pleasure. Is that right? Is happiness just pleasure? So we do have a difficulty of trying to define what happiness is, and how do we measure happiness? I talked about the shopkeeper and myself, like how do we even compare his unhappiness to my happiness? It's not like you can sort of put them on a scale and, and weigh them and see which one weighs more it, because you can't quantify happiness. It's a qualitative thing. It's, it's a quality that you can't give, uh, you know, sort of units to and then add them up or subtract them. 
Um, and utilitarians, they do talk in these sort of artificial ways of hap units. You know, they say, if John receives five hap units from uh, stealing the candy bar, but the shopkeeper receives negative three hap units, well, then you have a um, positive outcome of two hap units. All right, so then uh, you should be able to do this action because it has a positive um, outcome. But, you know, you'd need to weigh all the other possible actions you could have taken besides stealing candy bar, like seeing a movie or staying at home. And if stealing the candy bar has results in the most positive uh, hap units, then, yeah, that's what you should do. Um, but like, is, this is also artificial. Like, how do you measure happiness? I don't. I don't know that you you can. Maybe you could. Here's one way. You might be able to reduce happiness to sort of, you know, brain activity, and then you could like hook up instruments to people and measure their brain activity, and sort of quantify it that way. But I don't think happiness is reducible to activity in the brain. Ha happiness is a sort of subjective feeling, not, not um, uh, you know, like the interaction of um, neurons or something. Anyway, that was sort of a tangent. All right, so here are some objections to utilitarianism. You can point out cases in which utilitarianism gives the wrong answer to moral questions, just like we did with um, ethical egoism. So there are three different cases, the riot prevention case, the healthy donor case, and the promise-breaking case. Consider the riot prevention case. This is a case where, uh, say, there's a mayor in a town, small town, uh, and um, say there's an innocent person, Sally. So you've got the mayor, you've got an innocent person, Sally. Suppose that the townspeople, you know, they... They falsely accuse Mary, is that Sally, sorry. They falsely accuse Sally of committing a wrongdoing. Say they think that Sally um, kidnapped and murdered an uh, innocent person. All right, so the townspeople are really upset. And they go to the mayor. The mayor knows Sally is innocent. The mayor was with Sally at the time that the murder happened. And the mob is not even... They're, they're just, they're a mob. They're, they're rioting. They're not even willing to listen to reason. And so they go to the mayor and they demand that Sally be, um, that Sally be shot, right? Executed. All right. So remember, Sally's innocent. The mayor knows that Sally's innocent. And this mob is, they're just demanding that Sally is executed. And they're not going to stop. They're not going to rest until Sally is executed. Well, on utilitarianism, if the outcome of executing Sally would be that the townspeople are all made happy, and the outcome of not executing Sally is that the townspeople are very unhappy, well, then it looks like in this case, utilitarian utilitarianism demands that the mayor execute an innocent person. But that can't be right, can it? Okay, so here's a case where it looks like utilitarianism gives the wrong answer to a moral question. How about the healthy donor case? Suppose that you have, you know, a, der um, a derelict, a homeless person uh, who doesn't know anyone, uh, but is relatively healthy. This, this um, homeless person goes into a hospital just looking for a routine checkup. You know, it's covered under the ACA and so has health insurance and just wants to know how everything's going. Well, what, the, what this homeless person didn't realize is that the doctor has five patients who are in desperate need of organs. One needs a lung, the, another needs a lung, one needs a heart, one needs a kidney. Um, what's another organ that someone might need? Um, pancreas. I don't know. I'm a doctor of philosophy, not an MD. <laughs> okay, so um, the doctor sees this opportunity, right? He's, he says, this person is homeless, doesn't know anybody, is not well connected. I could kill this healthy person without anybody knowing, and I could distribute the, order, the uh, organs to the people who really need them, 
the five people uh, who are about to die because they need an organ. Now, if, if it would make the most people happy, you know, greatest happiness for the greatest number, for the doctor to kill this healthy donor and distribute the organs, then utilitarianism says he should do it. But doesn't it strike you as morally wrong for the doctor to just kill a healthy donor, even to save five lives? If so, then utilitarianism might not be the theory for you. Then there's the promise-breaking case. What if you can make all kinds of people happy by breaking a promise? If you think that, no, you should keep your promise even if it makes people unhappy, then utilitarianism uh, gets this case wrong as well. Right? So, um, if you should keep your promise, but it would make everyone happy to break your promise, utilitarianism says you should break your promise, but intuitively we think, well, you shouldn't break promises. It's morally wrong to break promises. Let me give you an example. Suppose you've promised your friend Fred. You made a promise to Fred that you would go see a movie with him on Thursday night. And then you find out about this really fun party, right? And Fred is a kind of a loner, a downer, and you're like, I don't, I don't know, I just promised Fred because I felt bad for him. And you're like, I really want to go to this party. And you know that you're, you know, you're like the life of the party. So you know that by going to this party, everyone's going to be made really happy. And Fred is going to be made sad, but isn't he usually sad, you know? So, okay, so you break the promise with Fred and make everyone at the party happy by going to the party. If the outcome of this is that the, it's the greatest happiness for the greatest number of all the actions that you could take, uh, then utilitarian, utilitarianism says you should break the promise. But doesn't morality require you to keep your promise with Fred and just say, hey guys, hey gals, I'm going to have to join you at the party another time or at another party? Okay, I want to say something now on behalf of the utilitarian. I've been bashing the utilitarian. Uh, I want to now try to come to the defense of the utilitarian. I want to distinguish between act utilitarianism and rule utilitarianism. Act utilitarianism says uh, that the principle of the greatest good for the greatest number should be applied on a case-by-case -case basis. You should choose the act that produces the greatest good for the greatest number. So you're thinking about the Fred case where you break a promise, right? Act utilitarianism says you should consider that particular case in itself and determine whether, you know, going to the movie or going to the party would produce the greatest good for the greatest number. Okay, so clearly you should go to the party on you act utilitarianism because that's going to be the greatest good for the greatest number, even if Fred is made unhappy. But rule utilitarianism says that a specific action, so like going to the party or going to the movies, is morally justified if it conforms to a justified moral rule. And a moral rule is justified if its inclusion into our moral code would create more utility than other possible rules or no rule at all. All right. So, rule utilitarianism says that you your actions should be guided by moral rules, and we should adopt those moral rules that have that serve to bring the greatest good for the greatest number. So, why do we think that we should on the on rule utilitarianism? Why do we think we should tell the truth? Well, because truth telling in a society produces more happiness than um, lying, so we should tell the truth. Um, so why, why do we think that we should respect other people's property? Because respect of property um, in the long run produces more happiness in a society than not respecting property, so we adopt that moral rule. So on rule utilitarianism, you don't judge the happiness that's produced for a given action, you judge the happiness that's produced for a given rule. And then you follow the rules no matter what. Okay, so in the Fred case, should he keep the promise or should he go to the party? 
well, if this if keeping promises makes for happier societies, then you should, or he, or whoever it is, should go to the movie with Fred. Should keep the promise, because um, even if it you know makes all the people unhappy at the party. Um, you should follow the rule that brings the greatest good for the greatest number. Okay, so there's the difference between act utilitarianism and rule utilitarianism. Act utilitarianism says you judge the rightness of an action on a case-by-case -case basis. Rule utilitarianism says you follow moral rules. Which moral rules? Those that bring the greatest good for the greatest number when implemented in a society in the long run. Let's apply those to our objections. Consider again our objections, um, the riot prevention case, the healthy donor case, and the promise breaking case. For each of these, act utilitarianism would give the wrong result. Riot prevention, you should hang the innocent person because that's going to bring the most happiness in that case. The healthy donor case, you should kill the healthy donor because that's going to bring the most happiness in this case. The promise breaking case, you should break your promise because that's going to bring the most happiness in this case. But what would the rule utilitarian say about each of these? Riot prevention. Well, if it would make for a happier society overall in the long run to have a rule which says that you should not uh, terminate uh, innocent people, then even though the mayor knows it's probably going to destroy the town to not uh, execute Sally, she, she realizes that I need to follow the moral rule that leads to the greatest good for the greatest number in the long run, so I'm not going to execute this innocent person. Okay, so even though it, for that case, even though it leads to unhappiness, you follow the rule because following the rules will lead to more happiness in the long run. Healthy donor case, so you, you say, even though it's going to you know, these five people are going to die, um, and all their families are going to be made unhappy. Uh, I don't, we follow the rule in the society that you don't just, you know, kill innocent people for the advantage of others, because to kill innocent people for the advantage of others uh, would make for an unhappy society overall. So the doctor should not kill the healthy donor, but should follow the rule that you don't kill innocent people for the advantage of others. And then the promise-breaking case, rule utilitarianism say, says, break, keep the promise because promise-keeping makes for a happier society overall, even if, you know, it makes the people at the party unhappy. And I guess Fred is made happy, so that's good. But the key thing is, is that you kept the promise, and promise-keeping overall leads to happiness. All right, so that's Ethical egoism and utilitarianism are two consequentialist theories.